All right. Well, today we're going to be starting a little series. I don't know how long it'll go for, but it'll go for at least two today and next week. And what we're talking about today is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So before we start, let's just pray. Father, we just come before you and just ask that you would help us as we discuss the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just ask that you would uh, open our hearts and open our minds, help us to understand your word. Just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and give us understanding. Your word says, if anyone lacks understanding, let him ask, and you will give to him freely. So, Father, we ask that you would help our, uh, help us in our understanding of this particular topic. Thank you, Yahweh. Amen. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. There are differing opinions and thoughts on the Holy Spirit. On what it is, its function, and does it play a role in a believer's life? It is my opinion, and I hope to show this in the Scriptures, that with a resounding yes, the Holy Spirit is an intimate part of a believer's life. As Yeshua himself said, the Father will send you a helper. And we read this particular verse in John fourteen twenty six. But the helper, this is Yeshua speaking in John fourteen twenty six. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Very powerful and important verse for a believer. You can only bring something to remembrance if you've read it. <laughs> it's not just ma magic wand that he waves around and voila, there it is. No, he wants you to have a relationship with him and part of that is reading his word and then he can bring rem it to remembrance to you. Many have their own ideas and thoughts as to how the Holy Spirit operates on, in, or with different people. And this varies from one's own experience of the Holy Spirit. So, for example, if one's background is a Pentecostal charismatic church, like mine was, and others that are here, if that's your background... That particular ver uh, person, their view or experiences are different from a more traditional church denomination, one that may have gone to a very um, conservative sort of place. One who has the Pentecostal background could walk in to a more conservative church and say, this is dead. There's no light here. There's no Holy Spirit here. And they say that because the Holy Spirit is not, they say that the Holy Spirit may not be there because no one is acting or behaving in their view or experience that they've had of the Holy Spirit in their own church. So this happens a lot. People, especially if you come from a Pentecostal charismatic background, you can go into a more traditional place and if they don't do the same things or behave in certain ways that you're used to, one could automatically assume that they don't have the Holy Spirit. So I would like to express that one needs to be very, very carefully making these judgments based on their own experiences of the Holy Spirit and then project that onto someone else and declare that they do not have the Holy Spirit because simply because you're not behaving or acting like I do. And this happens more often than you would think. The Holy Spirit manifests differently throughout the whole word of Yahweh. He manifests as he operates differently 
right from Genesis all the way through the Revelation, he, 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 he uh, manifests himself differently. Many modern-day believers think that the Holy Spirit is in the New Testament only. But is this true? And is this correct? And the way, reason why they may come to this assumption that the Holy Spirit is mainly in the New Testament is because many pull out their Bibles and look for the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And we'll find that particular phrase, Holy Spirit, only three times. So therefore, they come to an assumption that the Holy Spirit is not really in the Old Testament. He's very rare and, and he's not really there. So therefore, he's only in the New Testament because I can see this particular phrase everywhere in the, in the New Testament. So they say it or can assume that it's very rare in the Old Testament and then is only really a New Testament thing. This is why, you may or may not have known this, but this is why Charismatics and Pentecostals have their particular names. This is why you have a Charismatic movement or a Pentecostal movement. It's solely based on the Holy Spirit. And I'll explain why. They believe... The church started at Pentecost, so therefore they're Pentecostals because the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost in their eyes because they read English versions of the Bible. And that's what it says in English, but not necessarily in Hebrew. So they come to the assumption that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, so therefore we're Pentecostals because we're filled with the Holy Spirit and it was poured out on the day of Pentecost. It's also when the gifts seem to have started on that same time is when the gifts started to be revealed. Charisma, we, we have this in our English word, he's got charisma. It's used a little bit different in English, but in, in Greek, Greek is charisma is a Greek word. And it's the word that they use, one of the Greek words they use for gifts. So therefore, we have we are charismatics because we operate in the gifts that started at Pentecost. So therefore, you have charismatics and Pentecost, but they're all based on the Holy Spirit. All this is because of English translations and the Western mindset in reading the Word of God. English is a translation of the Greek and Hebrew, but predominantly the Greek. So this is what is behind the doctrinal theology that the Holy Spirit is only mainly in the New Testament. Because people don't find the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So therefore, the Holy Spirit was not really active. But I would like to show you that nothing could be further from the truth. As when one starts to read and search the scriptures in the original language, which is Hebrew, one will see the Holy Spirit everywhere in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh. And we'll explain this as we go on. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh. So before we move into more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to set some foundations we're going to understand some Hebrew words, which I think is a good idea before we try and endeavour to understand what this Holy Spirit is. So with that said, it would be a good idea to look at some Hebrew words to reveal the Holy Spirit. Obviously, we have two words here, holy and spirit. Pretty straightforward. These two words mean different things in English than what they do in Hebrew. They are also viewed very differently in Hebrew mindset than the Greek westernized mindset. So like you know, it's very important that we need to try and understand our Bibles from a Hebrew mindset because these are the people that wrote it. It was written 2000 years ago in a Hebrew culture, in a Hebrew language. And that mindset and that language is very different from 21st century westernized mindsets. And too often we read our Bibles from our mindset and not theirs. 
So here we go. The Hebrew word for holy. See, holy is an abstract word. What do I mean by that? It means many different things to many different people. I could say to someone, what do you think holy is? And they would automatically maybe get a picture of the Pope with a big pointy hat and special robes and a little scepter and he always oh, holy, you know, or people come up with their own, what their experience is of the word holy. So it's this abstract word, but Hebrew is a very concrete language and we'll see that as we go on. So the word holy in Hebrew is Kadesh. This is the Hebrew word, Kadesh. Hebrew goes from right to left. And upon looking upon this word, you'll find this in the dictionary that it means to be sacred, sacredness, apartness, set apart, holiness, places and things. For example, the anointing oil was holy. The priestly garments were holy because they're the only ones that wore them. The furnishings in the tabernacle, like the, the, the menorah, the candlestick, the Ark of the Covenant, the showbread, the altar, all these different things are holy because they were specifically used in that place. And then the, all those furnishings had utensils that went with them. They're holy. They were only used for that particular furnishing. People were holy. For example, kings were holy. They were holy because you can only have one king. And the priests were holy. So we can see this, the, 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 the sense of holiness here to set something or some, someone or something apart for a special purpose. That's exactly what a king is. His purpose is to rule and to reign and to run the place. The priest was set apart because their purpose was to minister to Yahweh in the tabernacle. It also means to be separated out from the rest. And again, we see this in the priest and the king. They were separated out from the rest of the tribes of Israel. They were separated out from the rest of the people. The high priest was separated out from the rest of the priest because he was holy. Consecrated is another word that we can use. But some of these meanings, as I was explaining earlier, are still abstract terms. For example, sanctified, consecrated, sacredness, and holiness. They all mean different things to different people. But in Hebrew, we get a very concrete picture of this meaning, and we're about to find that out. So with that being said, let's drill down a little further and get a concrete meaning that most of us can identify with. The beauty of Hebrew words is that they tell a story of their meaning. So Kadesh, as we go back up to the top here, Kadesh has the root Akuf, which is that funny Q shape. Oop. Funny Q shape letter. That's a Kuf. That one's a Dalit. And then that third one's a Shin. That's what they're called in Hebrew. Kuf, Dalit, Shin. Now the Kuf is the first letter because we're reading from right to left. So even the language goes opposite to Greek. We're going from right to left. So Kuf, that first letter, can have a meaning. Every Hebrew letter has a meaning as well. So within English we just say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That, that's just what they are. In Hebrew, each letter has a meaning. So this is why we can get the meaning of Hebrew words just through the letters. So this first letter, kuf, it can mean behind or that which is left. That's what that letter can mean. Behind or that which is left. The last two letters, the Dalit and the Shin, the last two letters, when you put them together, it forms another Hebrew word. And that word is dush. Dush. Right? And that word means to thresh or threshing. So if you were to dush, that means you're threshing or to thresh something. So this is so this is what happens when they say the wheat is threshed. They thresh the wheat and the chaff is blown away in the wind. 
and what remains is the wheat. The grain is left behind. Or when the ox in, in, in ancient culture, this is why we need to understand the culture of our Bibles. When they used to, another way they used to separate the grain from the husk is that they would lay it all out on the ground in a big circle on the ground that was called the threshing floor. And in the middle they would have a stone or a rock that they, or they would have someone lead an ox and they would go around and around and their hard hooves would tread out the grain and break out, break off the husk, separate the grain from the husk. That was also known as threshing. So when they, they lifted up the grain or the wind blew the chaff or when the ox went around and treaded out the grain, this was known as this dush, this word. But what was left behind? The grain. The grain was left behind. We now have a concrete, tangible picture of what holy is. The grain was left behind. So the grain was holy. This is a natural, tangible picture of what holy is. After the threshing was done, that which was holy was left behind. It was set apart from the husk, from the grain, and the wind blew it away. So this is how they thought of holiness in, from a Hebrew perspective, because they did this every wheat harvest. They did this every barley harvest. They were separating, making holy the grain. This is just how they think. Very concrete, functional picture. The grain is holy because it is set apart from the husk. So biblically, holy is to be set apart for a special purpose. We see that play out with the high priest and the priest, who were the tribe of Levi, the Levites. They were separated out from the rest of the 12 tribes to be priests. The holy oil, that they lit the menorah. The menorah was the lampstand that they had in the tabernacle. They had to have special oil for it. That was called the holy oil. It was specifically used for that lampstand, for that menorah only, and not for anything else. The high priest's clothing was set apart, especially only for the high priest. They're the only ones that could wear it. We also understand this between the, the teachings of what's clean and what's unclean, what's righteous and what's unrighteous. This is all separating out, making holy, etc., 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 Here's a picture. This is someone threshing out the wheat. So they're throwing it up and the wind would catch it and blow the chaff away and what was left would remain. And here's another picture of the ox. See how they go around and around? He's treading out the grain. He's separating the wheat from the husk. This is what they do. This is how they did it back in ancient times. So that's the word for holy to be set apart, to be separated for a special purpose. Now we're going to explain the word ruach, which is the word spirit in Hebrew. This is the word spirit in Hebrew. And this word ruach means breath, wind, spirit. The wind can be from the slightest breeze, like a really gentle breeze, like it may be outside today, to the to a hurricane, to a really strong tempest, and everything in between. This can mean ruach or breath or wind. And it's also the English word for spirit because in most people's understanding perspective, a spirit is this vapor. This no one can really explain it. It means different things to different people. But in Hebrew, the most concrete meaning of Spirit is the wind, or the breath, our breath. That's, that's, that's Ruach as well. So the wind or breath or spirit is something that is unseen. You can't see the wind. You can't see someone's breath under normal circumstances. It's, but its natural meaning is revealed in the effects of the wind. So we can see the wind by the effects of the wind. We see that the branches swaying in the, in the trees. We see fabric blowing or whatever. We, see, we know that it's windy because we see the effects of the wind. So ruach is an action or doing word, which is 
unusual for a noun because ruach is a noun, it's a thing. But it's an action, it's a doing word. So the first occurrence, whoop, the Holy Spirit is the active presence of Yahweh. So now we're getting down to the bones. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the active presence of Yahweh. This is one of the ways the Holy Spirit manifests, which is the power of Yahweh. So whenever you read the power of Yahweh in your Bibles, that's the Holy Spirit being manifested. For example, the burning bush. That was Yahweh in the bush, but it was manifesting as a spirit by fire. Another example is when Yahweh sent an east wind and divided the Red Sea. That was the spirit. It was the active presence of Yahweh. Here's an example. First occurrence of the word spirit or holy, uh, the word spirit or wind in our Bibles, which is normally when you come to the first occurrence in your Bibles, that's normally the most accurate, concrete meaning of a word. So here we are, the second verse of our Bibles, Genesis 1 2. And it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering or other versions say fluttering, over the face of the water. So this is an active. The Spirit of God was hovering. The active presence of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the Spirit is the active presence of Yahweh. And then you add holy onto it, it's the only presence of Yahweh because it's separated, it's set apart because it's Yahweh. We'll understand this as we keep going. So with the two words we have just gone through, Kadesh and Ruach, this is what gives us the English words Holy Spirit. These give us a picture of the meaning of Holy Spirit, which is the active presence of God separating the wheat from the chaff. As we saw in the picture before, they threw up the wheat into the air. And what separated was the wind, the breath that separated and what remained was holy. So we see that this is the active presence of God separating the wheat from the chaff. The wind blows away the chaff, which then reveals the grain or the fruit. The Holy Spirit is the active presence of the Holy Spirit is the active presence or energy of Yahweh, i.e. the wind. Understanding these words now we can see that the Holy Spirit is now revealed all through the Old Testament not just a manifestation. And we see it here. It doesn't say Holy Spirit, it says Spirit of God. What else could it be? It's the Holy Spirit. It's just another way of saying it. Spirit of God. In the second verse of our Bibles. But the Holy Spirit's rare, it wasn't in the Old Testament. Yes, it was. Here we go. 363 times the word Ruach is found in the Old Testament. 548 times Kadesh is found, the word Holy. But looking up the English words Holy Spirit is found three times. But if you went the other way and looked up Ruach, you'll find it 363 times. If you went the other way and looked up Sorry, yeah, if you went up the other way and looked up Kadesh, you would find it 548 times. Just because it doesn't say holy, it doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not there. They didn't speak English, they spoke Hebrew. The word spirit, directly connected to Yahweh, is found well over 100 times. So of those 363 times, the word spirit in direct connection with Yahweh is found well over a hundred times. So it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Yahweh. It is at least 30% of the occurrences in the Old Testament directly connected to Yahweh. Thirty percent of the occurrences in the Old Testament is directly talking about the Spirit of Yahweh or the Holy Spirit. How do I know this? Because I went through every occurrence 363 times, verse by verse, 
and I found out myself over a hundred times, and that was being conservative. Over a hundred times, it is talking about the Spirit of God. Not Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, or breath of God. And the rest of the times is predominantly talking about natural wind and the Spirit of man and those types of things. So here we see, just from looking at the Hebrew, the Holy Spirit is all through the Old Testament. It's not a New Testament thing. So now we have an understanding now that the Holy Spirit is found all through the Old Testament by looking at the Hebrew words, Ruach Kadesh. So literally, to say Holy Spirit in English is Ruach HaKadesh. You will hear that terminology a lot, especially if you hang around here long enough. Ruach HaKadesh means the Holy Spirit in Hebrew. But, of course, like I said, you'll only find these if you look at the Hebrew. This is why it's important to go a bit further and study these things out, which I would add probably 95% of Christianity does not do. It's, it's mind-boggling to me. So moving along, we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit now. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the Greek word for baptism is baptisma. And interesting, this word is not, this word is not used outside of the New Testament. It's a New Testament idea. It's something that they had to, to uh, make, make up. It, this Greek word is not found in any Greek literature. It's a biblical specific term, baptisma, and that's the word that they uh, came up with to try and best express what the Hebrew word is for this, which is what we're going to look at. So the Greek word is baptisma, but a couple of examples of this word in the New Testament is Acts 1.5. For those that don't know, Hebrew, uh, Old Testament is mainly Hebrew language, New Testament is mainly Greek. So whenever we're going through Greek words, we're always going to be referring to the New Testament. But however, it is my opinion that the New Testament was also written in Hebrew, that these words are translations from the Hebrew. So here we are, Acts 1.5. For John surely baptized with water. There we have the word baptized, baptisma. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So it's something that we need to do. This is why we're talking about it. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit is something that a believer should endeavor to, to do. But John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Here's another example, Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, referring to Yeshua, Jesus, he will, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We're going to go through this verse. This is being misinterpreted and it will change your whole perspective. Anyway, that's for another time. 1 Corinthians 10.2. Remembering these are all examples of the word baptisma in our Bibles. 1 Corinthians 10.2. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptised into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the one Spirit. So it's just talking about this is for everybody. Everyone's required to be baptised into the one Spirit. What's that one Spirit? The set-apart Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of God. John 1.33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. So what happened after Yeshua got baptised? The heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then he's saying, this is the one who will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. So they're just examples of the Hebrew, uh, the Greek word baptism. So now we're going to understand, or endeavour to understand, what the Hebrew is for baptism. 
There are two Hebrew words predominantly used for baptism or immersing. Another way of saying baptism is to immerse, is to dunk, is to totally immerse your body or whatever you're baptizing into, into a liquid. So here we are. The first Hebrew word is tabal. And this predominantly means to dip or to bathe or to plunge into a liquid. Makes sense, pretty straightforward. This is the Hebrew word tabal. Sometimes we like to go into the... Uh, bef- this is here is the Hebrew language script. Now before that they drew in pictures. And those pictures had meanings which then was transferred to these meanings. So at times we like to go into the pictograph of the Hebrew language. We're going way back now, thousands of years. And this is the Hebrew word, the same word, Tabal. This is the pictograph. That is the Tet, which is that letter. That's the Bet, which is that middle letter. And that's the Lamud, which is the last letter. So I'll put it in left to right, so we could follow it in the Greek. So that's Tavau. So that first letter there, that means to surround. That second letter there is the house, so that's like the footprint of a house, a picture of a house. That third letter is, is the Lama, and it means the leader or authority. So that is a picture of a shepherd's crook. The shepherd that was the leader or the authority of the flock, and they used to guide the sheep. They used to have authority over the sheep by their shepherd's crook. So that's what that meant. So when you combine all these meanings together, it means to be surrounded. This is when you're baptised. You're surrounded by the leader of the house. Who's the leader of the house? Yahweh. This is why it's very important to endeavour to get water baptised and then baptised in the Holy Spirit get surrounded by the leader in the house, that protection and that that guard that we were talking about before. This is why I love Hebrew, that it just explains things so much more deeply. Here's an example of this word, Taval, Exodus 12, 22. You shall take a bunch of hips, hyssop, dip it in blood. That's that Taval, dipping, dip it in blood, which is the liquid that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two door posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you should go out the door of his house until morning. Now this is pretty powerful because what happened, this is talking about when they had the Passover. They killed the lamb, they dipped the hyssop in blood and they painted around the door frame. What happened? They were surrounded by the leader of the house that passed over them and protected them. But they had to dip first. They had to immerse first. What a powerful concept. That was what protected them. If they didn't do this, they were going to die. Or the, sorry, the firstborn would have died. So here we see a very powerful, tangible picture of this in the pictograph about being surrounded. Oh, I think that's amazing. Here's another example. In 2 Kings 5.14. So he went down, this is talking about Naaman who was a foreigner, he wasn't even a Hebrew. He went down and dipped Tabal seven times, immersed seven times into the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So this particular person had leprosy, and he came to the prophet in Israel. The prophet said to him, go and dip Tabal seven times in the Jordan River, and you'll be healed. And this is exactly what happened. So again, that leader of the house surrounded him and he got healed. Powerful, powerful pictures. One of the things I like about the meaning of this word, which means to dip or immerse into a liquid, for example, water, the same picture here, I'm going to give you another tangible picture. It's like dipping the dipping of a garment into a dye. This is how they used to colour their, their clothing back in the day. They used to dip their garments into a dye, to bow. Their garments, immerse their garments, baptise their garments into a liquid, into a dye. In, that, in this example, the garment is forever changed. 
after it's been dipped into the dye. It may have been whatever colour it was, white, grey, whatever colour the garment was. As soon as it got dipped and immersed into that dye, whether it was red, purple, blue, that garment was forever changed after being dipped. The same may be said of one being immersed by the Holy Spirit, they may be forever changed. I think that's a beautiful picture. This is why baptism is so important. Water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Another Hebrew word for immersion, and I said there was two, this is another one, and it's called rahatz. Rahatz. And this means to wash and also trust. Why? Because in the old days, in the, in the ancient Bible times, the servant used to wash the, the master's feet or they used to wash guest feet when they came to visit. They used to wash the feet of the, uh, of the master or of the, of the guest. So it means to trust as in a trusted servant who washed the master's feet. The original meaning of rahats is to wash thoroughly, to immerse in liquid. And here we have in the same example we were talking about earlier when that guy had leprosy and went down to the Jordan. In that same story, he uses both Hebrew words. It uses Tabal and it uses Rahatz. And this is where it says the prophet Elijah said, sent a message to him saying, go and wash into the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you shall be clean. So we're just about finished. We, we need to understand these words before we go into the application of baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is what we're going to be doing next week. And I think by doing that, we'll get a greater understanding of what it is means and what it is to, is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So to put it simply, the Holy Spirit is the active presence of Yahweh. It's his breath. It's his wind. His manifestation in our natural realm. Just like when the wind blows in the natural we see the manifestations of the leaves fluttering and, and whatnot. So it's the manifestation of Yah in, the, in our natural realm. The unseen becomes seen. It is the effects of Yahweh. Just like we don't see the wind, but we can see the effects of the wind. The Holy Spirit is seen as wind, fire, water, voice, a voice, and dove. He descended like a dove on Yeshua. And there's many, many other ways that the Holy Spirit manifests in our Bibles. These are just a few. And we touched on this earlier, John 1.32. And John bore witness saying, so he actually saw this event happening. He's an eyewitness. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And he remained upon him. So the active presence of Yahweh manifested in this particular occasion as a dove and rested upon Yeshua. And in the context of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is set apart from everything else, from every other spirit. Why? Because it's Yahweh. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh. And this is why we need to understand culture. When Paul's writing letters, this is why the Holy Spirit is so prevalent in the New Testament, because he's writing all these letters to different churches that lived throughout the Greek Empire, like the Ephesians, the Thessalonians, the Philippians. Who else is there? The Colossians, the Romans. He's writing these letters, which is all the books of our New Testament. He's writing these letters to different churches in the Greek Roman Empire. Now, where these churches lived and where they, where they worshipped, there was many pagan gods. There was many pagan cultures. There was many other religions, and they had their spirits. So this is why Paul is saying the Holy Spirit. This is the set-apart spirit. This is the spirit of Yahweh. That's why he's explaining this spirit is not like all those other spirits. This is peculiar and particular to the spirit of Yahweh. This is why we see the Holy Spirit mentioned so much in the New Testament because he's writing letters to believers that are in these pagan cultures coming out from worshipping pagan gods. And he's, he's teaching them there's only one spirit. 
You're only baptised into one. It's the same spirit. It's the same body. We read that earlier. So this is why he's saying these things over and over again. He's teaching them that the Holy Spirit is, there's only one. There's not many others. And this is maybe what it looked like when it was descending on Yeshua at the baptism. So we'll just finish in prayer. Well, Father, I pray that as we meditate on these on these words and on, on what it means, what the Holy Spirit means, Father, I pray that you help our understanding, help us get a more concrete understanding of who and what the Holy Spirit is. And Father, I pray for us and for those that may not have been baptised, that they will weigh this as they meditate on, on what we've spoken about today. And Father, that they will endeavour in the future at some point to take steps to, to have, be baptised, to be immersed, to be surrounded by the Holy Spirit in their own life. For the Father, the first word we read out, the first scripture verse was that you sent the Holy Spirit to help us. You sent the Holy Spirit to teach us and to bring remembrance to us all things. This is why we need to be baptised in the Holy Spirit, because he's our helper. Father, I pray that uh, you will help again with our understanding of who and what the Holy Spirit is. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you're revealing to us the power of these words to ultimately draw us closer and give us a better understanding of who you are and a better understanding of your word. And we bless you and we thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.